Welcome, everybody, to the Te Ata Theater at Oklahoma Contemporary. I am Jeremiah Matthew Davis, the director here, and I am so pleased to welcome you to a special conversation uh, in honor of Nature's Course, the opening that just took place last night of our new exhibition. Uh, John Newsom, our artist, and Matt Dillon in conversation right here, right now, one time only, the 25th of this month. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome all of you, and before we get into our festivities, I wanted to thank our sponsors for this exhibition. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Phlogistics LP, I want to thank George Records, um, SSM Health, St. Anthony Hospital, uh, the Kennedy family, Annie Bohannon, the Chickasaw Nation, uh, and a long list of all of you who are here tonight to help us out, so thank you. Before I welcome our artists in conversation, I wanted to give a brief introduction. Uh, we have John Newsom, the reason for the season. John is best known for his large-scale oil paintings, 31 of which are on view in the building today. Uh, he has been painting since uh, the 90s in New York for about 30 years. This exhibition explores the past 20 plus years of his body of work. He's participated in over 100 exhibitions nationally and internationally, and this is his first mid-career retrospective, where he's from, Oklahoma. Welcome him back, thank you. In conversation with John, we have Matt Dillon, who in addition to uh, being an uh, actor and director, is also a visual artist. He has a uh, practice uh, mixing oil and ink and collage uh, on paper, so they're going to get into the mechanics of art making uh, and creation for you tonight on the stage. Uh, Matt has a deep experience with Oklahoma. He had his screen debut in 1979 with Over the Edge. A few years later, he would go on to make three films in Oklahoma, the S.E. Hinton trilogy, Tex, Rumblefish, and Outsiders, and I wanna give a special shout out to Danny O'Connor, of the Outsiders Museum who's in the house tonight. And it, it happens to be today, we didn't plan this, the 39th anniversary of the, the debut of the Outsiders, which is cool. That's kismet, we didn't plan for this. Uh, but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage John Newsom and Matt Dillon. Come on out, guys. Go get him, guys. Hey, Jeremiah. Ah. Well, it's great to be here with you, John. It's great to be. Must be with very you exciting well, to see all this work. Yeah. One place, twenty years worth of work, yeah. and uh, and to be returning returning home. Yes. Here at this it's definitely relatively new museum. So, mm -hmm. museum's been for two two three years now, right? Is it? Uh, am I wrong about that? Does anybody that? know offhand the two? Boom, there we go. <laughs> you heard it from the man's mouth. Um, so John, we're gonna talk a little bit about, oh, there's a picture of us yeah. play, playing drums together. Yeah, there we are, there we are. So um, I guess the first thing I wanna, I wanna talk about with you and is to ask you about like where, when, and how it all started for you to, that you wanted to to become an artist, and I, one thing I know, I called you an artist. John prefers to be called a painter, and I know a lot of painters that are feel that way as well. It's uh, a distinction. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, artist painter, but I, I you know, I, I paint. That's the type of art that I make. I don't make sculpture. I don't do anything. I'm really in the alignment of painting. You know, and what you see in the exhibition, Nature's Course consists of 31 paintings made over the last 20 years. It was uh, Jeremiah's idea to uh, begin the exhibition with the uh, bodies of work at the turn of the century, and uh, I think it was a brilliant idea. Okay, He's, just for one second, the turn of the century, this is... See, doesn't that sound great? <laughs> so, I'm sorry, John, but it is, I was saying, are we talking about the 1890s or something? No. You know, no, I, know I got mean, a text from a dear friend of mine, the American painter Donald Batchelor, earlier today. He was reading something about the show, and it was a congratulatory, congratulatory text. Uh, it meant a lot to me. I've known Donald a long time, and he... 
he pointed out something like this. It wasn't turn of the century. It was at the period just at the beginning of the millennium. And he said, that's really like, that's hardcore. So I had to, it was fresh in my mind. So, but you know what? Painting is a very old medium. The Try process, true. it's ancient. I mean, even to talk about the turn of the century is young. That's a young term in terms of painting, you know? I mean, I think of painting in ancient Egypt and, you know, northern Japan and those painters that are out in those landscapes. And, you know, I, uh, I do think of naturalism. You know, you walk through the exhibition and you pick up on these things that are mm -hmm. old. It's not just about the... 20th century, although the 20th century is extremely viable in terms of abstraction, you know, and the large canvas and like the pictorial ideas and processes of uh, modernism. And, and I embrace that stuff. I, I don't like shy away from that. I want to tackle that. But I also want to take on these, you know, these older um, narratives mm. within the construct of painting's history. So. Well, you know. I mean, for those of, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the work. Um, <clears throat> well, there's John holding what looks to be a very... Getting back to your original question about where it all started. Yeah. Uh, Dodge City, yeah. okay, is right. something to confess. <laughs> Born in, in Dodge Hutchinson, City. raised in Dodge. Raised in Dodge, but... But yeah. very so, early came to Oakland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I was born in Kansas. Uh, early infancy and childhood in, in Kansas. And you know, this is what I would do. I would catch bull snakes and garden snakes and frogs and toads. It was like an all American childhood. And uh, I was drawing along uh, the timeline of, of that as well. You can see it in the learning gallery that the curators here at the Oklahoma Contemporary did such a wonderful job researching and laying out. You know, this exhibition uh, began uh, four years ago. We said the, the museum opened two years ago, but the idea for Nature's Course began before the museum was even built. I remember coming here, standing here in this place where it was just the skeletal structure of the building, and there's photographs of that. So right. it's been a long time in the making, and they went deep into these archives, but you can see snakes yeah, in the Yeah, I'm curious to know what became of that snake. Did you um, release it? I, I did. I released you taxidermed it. Taxidermed yeah, it. No, Don't lie to me. I released it, buddy. I released it. I mean, these are fun pictures. This is growing up. This is in Enid, Oklahoma, where you know I uh, I spent a long time in my childhood and to my teenage years, and you know uh, my parents, Joe and Claire Newsom, who are here tonight. I'd like to recognize them. They're right there. Uh, yep. 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 Yep, it's really meaningful that they're here and they still live in Enid and that's where that shot was taken. Um, I mean, we can just roll with it. I, uh, this is a departure from... Yeah, yeah, we'll say, yeah, we'll say that. I don't know if my son's... My, my son's hair is almost that long right now. I mean, I had to wait a little bit longer, but anyway, I guess it's the... It's the Luke, there's Luke Newsom right there and Ruby, my daughter. So, you know, I mean, here you have... So let me tell you about this. abstract work. Gotta, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I was in Enid, I, was, uh, I discovered American pop art at the local library and uh, started reading art news when I was a teenager and I discovered an uh, advertisement, a quarter page ad in the back of our news for this summer camp called Interlochen uh, Music Camp in northern Michigan outside of Traverse City. And it said that they had painting there for summer camp. And I was going to sports camps and uh, church camps and, you know, regional camps in Oklahoma. And I'd never heard of paint, you know, an art camp I could go to. So, you know, I brought this to my parents and I said, this is something I'm interested in. Oh my gosh, what, what is this, you know, et cetera. They embraced it and I went off and ended up going to the academy there and graduating from Interlochen. And this is an Interlochen in Northern Michigan. And, you know, it was great because I got to start doing real uh, study into uh, art history, you know. Uh, but, you know, you were the inspired. The academy, the scholar, yeah. like that kind but of stuff. But you were inspired to go and, and 
to find out more about this camp and to enroll in this camp. Yeah. But what were you doing prior to that? What were, where, where did the interest come from? I mean, I see the, with the snake I, and stuff, uh, so I could see the interest in the natural man, world. I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. I mean, when I was a kid, we had a magnolia tree in our backyard and I would go and sit in this magnolia tree at like, and I, and I would just sit there for hours spacing out into the blossoms and nature and looking at the at uh, praying mantises and the butterflies. And I was like, it was just, it was magical, you know? And uh, now we see those in 10 by 10 foot paintings in, in, in the, the drawings main gallery. in your childhood, yeah. were there, I mean, I've seen, because there are, you know, it really takes you through your childhood. There's a yeah. salon wall that's interesting, but you did a lot of interesting drawings, and there is there are elements of that, too. Yeah, and it, you know, it's not to say that that's something I've always done, you know, but now here I am having a mid-career retrospective at a museum, and it's spanning 20 years of mature adult work, and it's different than presenting work that you build out over a six month period to two years and show in a gallery, say this is a new chapter, I wonder how people will react to it. I mean, this is 20 years, it's much bigger than I can even, right, <clears throat> excuse sure. me, wrap my head around. So there's so much going on in it that um, one of the words over the past week that I've become very attuned to is the term understanding. And you, you look at the etymology of that term, understanding, mm -hmm. and you think of like when you build the foundation of a house, you know, and you have the roof of the house, and you need to s check to make sure that that roof is secured, you know, that it's well built, that it has a strong foundation. Mm -hmm. You're standing under the roof. You're studying the structure, you know, you're you're, you're citing everything to make sure it's balanced. And that's where the term understanding comes from, right? I'm so to have that idea of understanding in relationship to the build out of the surface structures of these paintings over the past 20 years is just an incredible gift to me as a painter because I'm, the conversations that are occurring between individual works that span several decades of time you know, that's a brand new experience for me. And it's something that I can take forward. I mean, I, I can't wait to get back, a part of me, can't wait to get back to the studio in New York and launch into I think a new big, paintings. I think a big part of you. <laughs> can't wait yeah, to get back yeah, to that. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's that, and you've got to live through it. You know this. You've got to make the work. You've, it just doesn't, you don't just walk into a gallery like, at the Oklahoma Contemporary, see nature's course and expect it to be there. You gotta go through the blood, the sweat, and the tears, and the daily grind. Whether you wanna get up and do it or not, on many days I wanna get up and I'm excited to get to the studio, and there's other days that are, well, you know, but overall, it's just, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have it gathered like this. And it was so well curated by Jeremiah and the team here. And, you know, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Yeah, really, really beautiful job yeah, in the installation. Yeah, thank you again. Let me get a round of applause for the team at the Oklahoma Contemporary. Excellent. Yeah, that's what's up. And how long did it take for the installation? How long? Um, what, three days? Steve Boyd and his team did an excellent job of installation. Um, you know, it was a, these are big canvases. These are physical things, you know. It took a team of, I don't know, seven, seven mm. guys to get this done. And uh, this is the earliest work in the show. Um, from 2001, it's a piece titled Labor of Love. It comes in from New York, from the Norman Dubrow collection. Um, Norman is my oldest living collector that lent work for the show at 95 years of age. He couldn't be here with us this evening, but I'd like to recognize Norman and thank him for um, lending this painting. Uh, this work was originally displayed uh, in New York in a solo show that opened five days before 9-11. So, I mean, you can imagine, I, uh, I was late to fill a prescription um, with my pharmacist in the basement of Tower One because I'd been up the previous night too long 
painting in the studio, but I'm glad I was. And otherwise, I would have, I would have been in the basement of, the, of Tower One. Um, but once that event happened, the reading on labor of love changed, for me at least, forever. So I see it today. It's an incredibly emotional painting, um, but it's even heightened now for that. And I got to tell you, standing in front of this, I hadn't seen this painting. I hadn't interfaced with this work for 20 years. And I, it was fresh as the day it was painted for me when I saw it. The colors holding up very strong, the surface. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very emotional, you know? I mean, some of my paintings wear their iconography and, on their sleeves, you know? This one certainly does for me. So I, uh, I'm happy that it's the first image of the works included in this slide presentation. You have anything to say on this one? I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of um, animal consumption going on. Uh, <laughs> but I yeah. think that's okay. Well, and you know I want to talk to you about that. Because well, I let me say one thing okay, before go we go into that, man. Because you do physical performances, all right? There's yeah. aspects of that, right? It's not that, like, the mood differentiates between the paintings. They're not all, like, bombastic like this. Mm -hmm. This one just happens to be, like, this amalgamation of, like, uh, hunting and feeding and like frenzy and uh, you know all these different em emotions simultaneously uh, can you know being contained within the parameters of the picture plane I wanted to push it all in there you know yeah. everything in the kitchen sink into this you know and then the towers came down the exhibition closed immediately and that was it until now you know that painting got uh, to be in front of eyes for five days, and then it went into Norman's storage space for 20 years, and now it's back here for a proper run till August 15th at the Oklahoma Contemporary, you know? And I can't, I'm so excited, Matt. I'm excited for the work. You know, I, I, I painted these paintings, I am the author of these paintings, but at this point, I'm, honestly, I'm a participant. Like, I was asking people at the public opening last night about works like they were the artist, you know? Because mm -hmm. I was wanting to learn more about the paintings. And, you know, so it's a, it's a great experience to be able to step out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, so. Well, you know, the thing with the... Let's kick to that I one. I know we about this looking, picture a little bit. Let's go to that one. Well, yeah, this is, I know because I spoke to Cassie. She said, this is our painting, Cassie Johnson. Wife. My wife is here, Cassie Newsom. I'd like to recognize, it was her birthday yesterday, so happy belated birthday. But she and I met in front of this painting 20 years ago, and so it's a special painting for us, and I'm glad that you brought that up. It's, where, uh, where was it? Where we were it? in Houston, Texas. It was installed in a group show. My dealer at the time convinced me to fly down from New York for the show, and she happened to be standing in front of it the day before when I walked in, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. So that's how that is. Um, it came in from a collection in San Francisco. Again, I hadn't seen this painting for 20 years, um, and the collector was able to fly in for the opening. It was a really nice... Uh, you know, dovetail of events that brought this painting to Oklahoma. And you know what, again, like being a kid, growing up, kicking cans, watching grasshoppers hop around a ye old fishing hole and stuff like that out here. I mean, that's in there, you know? I never denied where I came from. I just had to go experience all the rest of it too, you know? It's like, it was a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. And so I look at this now, you know, being yeah. kind of fully realized, and to a degree and, and being like, wow, that's it. That, mm. that took the time it needed to take in order to actually appreciate it for mm. what it is. You know, there's a certain distance now that uh, is lovely. It's, it's really lovely. Mm. And then, boom, like. Okay, you know. so this painting is a particular favorite of mine, Goodbye to Romance. And I'd like to just address that in your work. So what we see a lot in the paintings are the animals themselves, the, flora, the fauna, but there's also, there's other things going on here as well. Metaphor. Yeah. Uh, allegory, a lot of allegory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, 
you know, goodbye to romance. It's like, this is kind of an intense, romantic, you know, heartbreaker of a painting because it's like, you know, what happens in the dance of the courtship of the praying mantis? It's like, you know, the female rips off the head of the male after it ejaculates and it's done, you know? It's like game over. But nice. what I'm interested in Not in nice. particular with this painting from a formal standpoint is that the background the silhouette of those irises and the yellow is painted last, okay? So I painted all of the flora and fauna on this piece first, and then I went in with this labor-intensive like, process to get those monochrome shapes painted in, which took about two years. Now, I have to be honest, this was the last painting that was made before a solo exhibition in New York, and I didn't quite make the deadline. It was installed in the gallery, I still needed to fill in some of the background. This is all oil painting. And there were a couple of art handlers that were finishing up installing. And I said, guys, grab those brushes. OK, so this is a disclaimer, because I don't use assistants to make my paintings. I make all of them myself. But in this instance, I said, guys, and they, they, I said, you got to pick up those brushes, and you got to help me get on this. We have to get done by 6 o'clock. And, and we finish this area enough, enough, that I could pass it off at the opening. Then I went back and repainted all, everything they had done perfectly. So, you know, it was realized, but it was frantic. And um, a wonderful collector named Cy Newhouse was looking at this painting, and it was just he and I. He loved the painting. He put it on reserve. He said, I want this. I just have to go check the measurements on my elevator. He went to do it, he had to cancel the reserve because physically it couldn't fit in the space. So, you know what, I really liked him. I would have loved to have got this piece in his collection, but there was a moment where it's like physicality, the physical size of the painting where he had a wall in mind, it didn't make the cut. So, you know, that's just one of those things that happens because you can't, we can look at it on a screen, we can download it to a computer, you could turn it into an NFT, you could send it out to space, you could do whatever you want, but it's not gonna be the same experience as viewing it upstairs, or I guess downstairs, in the Oklahoma Contemporary. Yeah, the texture of the work is so you important. You gotta it's witness important. it live, man. That's what the beauty of painting is about. That's why it's been around for thousands of years. It's a physical now, it's a large situation, How but long, that's a, I digress. I mean, I know, I know that you had to go back in on it, but for the majority of it, how long? That was definitely a few years. I mean, it takes wow. four, three to four months minimum on a painting up until uh, maybe five years on a painting titled Harvest that I think we're going to get to. But, you know, this is... Uh, I'm interested in many types of painting. I've always been interested in um, how painters uh, arrive at mark making and, and the types of mark making they do. And I feel, I don't shy away from the term signature. I mean, I'm not a painter that makes all green paintings. And I'm not a painter that makes a different set of paintings every show I do. But guess what? Those extremes, both of those are signature Styles. You can make all green paintings, that's your signature. You can make all different sets of varying paintings for show by show, and that's a signature, you know, and everything in between. But I'm interested in an amalgamation of processes and mark making, and uh, I just come to that naturally, and, and I'm also uh, kind of dedicated to the idea of uh, the all over picture plane, which is a modernist idea. And you know, you look at the abstract expressionists going into people like Bryce Martin, who I, I admire tremendously. And then how do we, and Jonathan Lasker, and I'm like, how do you take the pictorial, you know, and the subject matter of nature and adapt it to the framework of that type of modernist inquiry of painting, you know? So, the monochromes or the gradients in the background, that's an all over situation. The, uh, the expressionistic mark making, um, you know, that's done with in applying with industrial mops and brick lane spatulas and varying types to varying degrees, that's another all over treatment. Then there comes this compositional hard edge uh, patterning with these archaic hermetic 
shapes like uh, circles and squares and rectangles. And then, you know, it's laced with these pictorial allegories of nature, again, that are, you know, uh, stretched edge to edge and sometime beyond the canvas. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a type of collage. I and mean, you and I have talked about this yeah. in the past. But it's an overall collage of the entire picture plane. So when you're looking at people like, you know, Francis Picabia or James Rosenquist or David Sally, I mean, these like really tremendously talented painters, mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's an isolated fragmentation that happens do for you, the most part. Do you part. work let from me, collage? Yes, I do, but let me get on this. So in those artists' work, you know, we, or for the most part, you're going to find that distribution of very marks within sections of the canvas, whereas mine, it's more like making a tight bed with, like, you know, the top sheet and then the, a certain blanket and this, and it's tucked tight and everything's edge to edge, you know? And then when it's done, hopefully it creates another type of atmosphere where these these seemingly differentiating forms can coexist. That's a big deal. For me, that was a big deal. And it was 1997 where I felt like I made my first mature painting in that manner. And, um, and it's fluctuated out, you know? I take routes where the paintings take me to go and the language, mm -hmm. you know, directs me. But that I would say, getting back to the idea of understanding, of standing under what's going on in the work, you know, I recognize that. I have to. That's what I have to do as a painter. I have to understand that. Otherwise, the paintings aren't going to hold up. And you cannot show a painting 20 years from when it was made and expect it to have legs. That, that's true, I, I would think, for the most part. So it's, it's a rigorous... It's a rigorous process. I, I, I wow. feel like I'm hard on myself with these, uh, with these paintings, you know? Because you want to challenge yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fun, I enjoy it, and it kicks my ass, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, this is a particular favorite, uh, Wandering Widow which uh, was lent by uh, Richard Massey, who's a dear friend, a wonderful collector. Um, and uh, I, I'm so pleased that this is in Oklahoma because, you know, this painting was presented in New York several times. And you just get a different reading when you're in an urban setting uh, with a work like this as opposed to seeing it here in Oklahoma. You know, I grew up in a horizontal landscape. My children are growing up in a vertical landscape. You know, that's a different type of read. And uh, this is a vertical painting, but it's a section of a horizontal landscape. Um, you know, they're strong. Flowers aren't normally painted like this. I mean, they're almost, they look like industrial things that are colorful in a way. But you start reading it around and you notice on the lower left, there's a black widow that's dragging off this bug and it's like this, creepy little innuendo down in the corner and you can, it changes the reading and yet you go right back up into the blossoms because um, that's just how the composition's laid out. It's like an all over piece. So, you know, I like to plant Easter eggs in the, in the works, you know, especially uh, the big ones. Otherwise, you know, it's, uh, it's not enough, you know. Well, let's, let's go back here. Speaking of like not enough. I mean, I, I don't think there's a square inch of, of surface left to paint on in this painting. Everything's like <laughs> taken back. The, uh, the background of this piece um, titled Love Flies In, which uh, came into the museum on loan from um, the Eileen Kaminsky family collection. Um, thank you, Eileen. Uh, is a, is a, a pinnacle piece for me for when it was made because of the, just the sheer balance of the forms of what I was needing to do to really uh, reach a, uh, a complete picture, if you will, of uh, this scenario. You know, we see lovebirds, and we see one bird that's impaled on the branches, okay? So it's kind of like the, I, you know, it's kind of the sacrificial or the uh, tormented, uh, individual within the uh, grouping of the flock, you know, and it's, uh, you know, there's, there's, 
I think there is humanity in the work. I think of humanity when I'm painting. From, there's, not, there's not representations of the human form per se in my work, but the human definitely completes the picture. I'm, I'm very aware of the viewer when I'm done with the painting, you know? I, I like that, I like to know that we are perceiving the paintings, you know? And that's what completes the picture for me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, a painting doesn't exist unless it's in, you know, unless it has eyes in front of it, you know? What's the use of having a painting in a crate, in a storage space forever? You gotta pull it out, you gotta get it up in front of eyes so people can experience it, you know? It's a palmaset, it's like, it's there to be uh, experienced, you know? And uh, so, although it's a pictorial representation of death, there's also a lot of life in this painting. Love flies in, you know? Uh, it's a thrill to share this with you all. I can't even tell you, so I'm so can I ask for where this. the impaled bird is? Because I'm having a hard time. Here. Because it's so, yeah, let's take a look. I'll show you. You can look at it more closely. It's right up here in the upper right corner. See it right there? It's kind of like, you know, I hide the blood and guts in uh, there and the uh, feathers. Okay. You see that? Yeah. So um, again, I look at, I go to the museums a lot. I look at painters like Chardin and, you know, these amazing, uh, you know, little Dutch still lifes and all the things that were going on within the brush and the medium, yeah. you know, how they, how they do that. And, uh, you know, it's tucked in there, you know? The background, the tree, actually is a reference to a Caspar David Friedrich painting. And the idea of German romanticism, these kind of deep feelings. Again, like the physicality of experiencing these paintings like you would an opera. You know, you only see an opera once. You know, you see Rigoletto maybe 10 times in a row, but it's never gonna be the same performance. It's gonna change every time, you know, because it's a physical experience. It's like the painting, you know. Ironically, the paintings don't change, just our daily experiences change, you know? That's what I'm saying. So if I see this painting, I haven't seen it for 15 years, I had children in, within that time frame. I'm just, things are gonna be different, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, to see the 31 paintings complete here in the museum, uh, these paintings will probably never be shown together in this way again yeah. as 31, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, anyway. For sure. It's very exciting to see. Now, what about this painting here? I was hunting in Kansas with my dad when I was a kid. And I was hunting pheasant, and I looked up in a tree, and I didn't realize pheasants didn't really perch in a tree, and I took a bean on this silhouette, and I shot it, and I was so excited because I, you know, this is what we were doing. This was the objective of the day to get pheasants, right? I ran up on it, and there was a giant great horn owl on the floor, and it was, and its, and its wing spans were wide, and it was wow. just like in a, you know, it was, it mm. was, I clipped him, it was gone, and uh, it was the most shocking experience because I mean, it was almost as big as I was. It was like, and I'd never been face to face with something like that in my. Wow. Father, bless him, bless him. You know, he just wow. ran right in front, grabbed it and beat its face in right in front of me. They put it out of his misery. It was a caring gesture, wow. I loved it. Wow. But I've lived with it and uh, sure. I put it all in shadow land, which is, that's, good. Uh, that's what it is. Get it out, John. Hey man, Get I'm it letting out. it all out, there you go. <laughs> there it is. Buddy. Wow, shadow, that's heavy. Now, let's go to this, because... There's um, Oklahoma down there. Yeah, it's yeah, it could be, yeah, it could be. I mean, this is an interesting painting, because there, it, you know, I talk about this all over, modernist thing, et cetera, but this, this has a landscape in it, you know? It's actually an articulation of a space. It's like, you can go into this ravine, you're experiencing these peregrine falcons, Beyond the fact that it's just these strong red discs in the background and then, you know, all this really physical, you know, painting with impasto, heavy impasto in the back in those mm. whites, you know. And uh, again, we're seeing it on a flat surface, but when you experience this painting in the yeah, flesh. Yeah, I think it's really important to, to see it, like, because the textures are such, it, sometimes they're almost three-dimensional, you know. Well, in fact, I think they are. You could say that. Yeah. You can make that argument. Yeah. For them, they're they're really uh, the texture makes a big impact on you when you see them 
in person, you know. Definitely. And I mean, I love the title Beyond the Horizon because it's been a big part of my life, you know. It's very relative to today here at the Oklahoma Contemporary because it's a homecoming, you know. You got to go beyond the horizon if you're going to really do that, you know. And uh, I certainly hope my children don't feel inspired to leave like I did. And I have to commend my parents again. To leave. For letting, you know, because, you know, we're tight family. It's a tight yeah. knit. It's like to let your, I didn't re, I knew I had to go and I commend them for, you know, supporting it. But man, if Luke or Ruby like had to, don't get any ideas. <laughs> and don't give Where them any ideas because they like film, man. Where I don't want to go, go to California and do something. No, I'm just kidding. But I say that, I say that with sincerity because it, you got to do it. You got to do it. So, you know, you have to embrace that if you have to go. This painting was made on the, um, right before my first exhibition, major show in Los Angeles. So I knew that this painting, although I made it in New York, I knew it was going to be presented for the first time in LA. And it was a, it was a big deal. I, I, I loved the art dealer that I was working with at the time there. And, uh, I, and I want to give a shout out to Patrick Painter because he was such an instrumental part of my development and my career. Well, he introduced us. And he introduced us. And yeah. so shout out Patrick. I, yeah, Patrick I, uh, been a great deal. I owe a lot to, I owe so, a lot to that So man. John, real, real, because this is a, a major painting and a major undertaking, what, what is the process from the beginning? I mean, you're great with titles. So sometimes <laughs> I think, sometimes you'll come up with a, just a great time. I'll go, wow, that is so great. Yeah. And, but where, where do you start? Do you start with Well, I kind of went through it a little bit earlier, but I'll go back on this, you know, on, in this piece because, um, because I, I, I can't stress enough. Like, it's like conducting, you know, and, when, and, and creating the grounds is like an overture. It's like a strong overture. I have to be really aware of the total picture plane. Like, it's got to be even, you know, there... It, it has to be balanced. I'm really into composition. It has to be balanced. Whereas once I get into these foreground elements, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're vignettes, they're small, it's like little, you know? So it's this balance between, you know, a wide Are angle sketches? and a detail. Are there sketches? There's sketches, there's drawings, there's collages. Studies. I work from anything, yeah, yeah. any and everything, Isn't you know? It's so important, I think, to do this yeah. kind of work, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is, you know? It's, uh, but there's still a made. lot of freedom in the in the in the the ground and in the yeah. it's not uh, there's still abstraction there, right? And that's really important because again, you have to know that the circles were painted last. So once you get these registrations, I mean, you, you, you're not necessarily going to need to know this when you walk in to the exhibition to witness it. But I'm here to give you a little backstory on the process. So I'm going to let you know that in this particular painting, the red circles were painted last. So I had to paint around all of the peregrine falcons and the cliffs and the foliage, etc. And so they're not really circles. I mean, even that circle, we'll say, at the top, it goes off the edge. So there's not a complete form anywhere. It's like an abstraction. It is literally abstraction, you know? If, uh, you know, if you're wearing an earring right now and you recognize that as a form on someone's shoulder, it's, it's not a natural extension of their ear. It's like offset. I'm interested in those juxtapositions. That's why, you know, Matt was talking about this, uh, this process of abstraction or, or formal thought. That's the language of painting, you know? I, when I'm doing that, I'm not thinking it's a circle, it's a peregrine falcon, you know, it's a gesture. I, I'm thinking of how is this balancing? How is this working, you know? Does this eye need to set here? How does the wing off the shoulder? I mean, I got really excited. I remember when I, when I painted this uh, falcon here in relationship to the edge off that shoulder, because this is so far in the foreground, this is supposed to be back in the background, but physically, they're located right on the same mm -hmm. plane, okay? So the, the, um, the composition became really fascinating to me like that. Um, mm -hmm. And it goes on and on and on, you know? It goes on and on and on. This, composition this took, is definitely... This took years. This took years, man. This took years. This took years. And I'm, I'm working simultaneously on three to five paintings at a time. 
But this one was, this one was a beast. Mm. Yeah, right, that on. nest, when you see it in the show, I don't know, or those of you who have already seen this painting, I mean, it's, it's, the brush has touched that form thousands of times with, an, with impasto, it's a loaded brush. It's not just flat, it's like, you know, it's a thicket unto itself. Like Matt said, it's almost sculptural in a way, you know? But um, here, let's, let's go forward. Whoa. Yeah, wow, yeah. Yeah, this is quite this, abstract when you get up yeah, on it, especially yeah. the two, two Scorpios. Yeah, exactly, and plus, you know, okay, this is like a dance of these scorpions in this lemon and lime grove, but it's also like a, uh, it's also a reverberation of this uh, spherical structure, okay? You get the circle with the gesture of their stingers and the circles of the lemons and the limes and the, and the, red geometrical spheres, and then it's just a dance, like looking at a Kandinsky, per se, but it just happens to be two scorpions in a lemon and lime grove. I mean, from, and it's a large canvas. This is almost to scale, as we're seeing it in the screen, how it exists in, in real life. And, uh, but there is this, that paint on the body of the scorpions. It's so dense, there's so much as they say in Italy, matera. Yeah, matera. Matera, which is the same as matter. impasto. Yeah, which so is the same as heavy. matter. Matter. Matera. You know? Matera. Yeah, exactly. The build up, is, it's, and you can't see that here. Yeah. You can only see that when you get up, yeah. and it's powerful. You know? But also, it represents potential, because it's, it's a, to me, it's kind of a beautiful painting, but you crack into a lemon or a lime and you eat it, it's gonna be sour. And there's a poison inside of these scorpions. So it's like these forms are like sour and dangerous and stuff, but I'm presenting it with like, you know, blossoms mm -hmm. and things. So it's like, you know, there's this, there's this interplay happening and uh, I get excited about this. Um, Cassie was pregnant with Luke, I couldn't touch color. I was getting ready for another show in LA at Could Patrick's. Could I just say why couldn't you touch color? I don't know. I'm being honest. I don't know. I just because I'm a, I'm a colorist. I love. I was. Color. Th I'm I thought you were going to say it. something because you didn't want to bring home any toxic. Because sometimes I'm always bringing home some, toxic. Sometimes but, certain paints have toxicity now, in it. You know. Yeah. But I know you wash your hands real good. I try. Coming home. I try. It's title father figure. It's kind of like an allegorical self-portrait, I suppose. But, you know, it's, it's a very minimal piece. The eye references, you know, the, the interplay between the pupils and the shapes in the background. I mean, I, uh, I, I like this piece a lot. It stands out in the show for sure. Yeah. Um, wow, you know, and now we go to something like this. Uh, my dear friend, the collector, Seth Goldstein lent this for the exhibition. Um, it's a 10 by 10 foot painting. It's part of a series of five 10 by 10 foot paintings, three of which are included in Nature's Course. Um, I'm really happy with the composition on this. It's something that I was, uh, you know, I was striving to do something that made sense and nonsense at the same time. Because you're not gonna see three wolves howling, standing on the top of three wolves that are in action moving forward on the back of a single wolf holding the leg of a deer in it, you know? I'd seen the Muscatero show that Gagosian did of Pablo Picasso, blew me away, I was so excited by it. Did you see that show? No, no. It was unreal, it was unreal. And uh, again, it was just such a great, uh, it, it was such a great interweaving of abstraction, great painting, freedom, articulation, mastery, and subject matter, you know, the Muscateros. And so, uh, you know, I really wanted to try to take something like that on and juxtapose it with the severity of the black cube, you know, the black square. You know, what does that mean in relationship to what's going on in the pictorial imagery, in the foregrounds, and the balance, and you know, it's, it's interesting because when I was speaking with Jeremiah, this painting was kind of, is it gonna make the cut? Is it not gonna make the cut? 
because the imagery is like, it's kind of, it seems violent, right? But once we got it installed in the gallery, it became one of the quietest walls. It's a very soft painting. And that's because of, I think, just the nature of the manner in which the fur is painted. It's like, I don't know, something like, uh, mm. something different about it. So it became the opposite of what we thought it was going to play. And that's, that's one of the real... Um, treats of, of installing a show like this is because until you get it up on the walls, you don't quite know how the paintings are going to relate to each other. But this one really is, is doing a, a beautiful job of uh, holding its wall in the show. Um, you know, this is like a five-foot pineapple. This isn't a life-size pineapple. No, no. It's you know, I'm very conscious of the heightenedness uh -huh. of this. Yeah. It's like, you want to look at some nature? Yeah. No, do you really? Well, I'm going to show it to you. Uh -huh. No, I'm going to show it to you. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, nothing gets sized down. Uh -huh. It only gets sized up. And uh, I think there's something about Oklahoma in there. I don't know what that just meant, what I said, but I, I think it's something it. about your personality, too. It could be. It could be. Exuberance. Yeah, fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I, you know, and that's interesting too, because, you know, I, I consider myself an extrovert, and yet I'm alone. I get to my studio, I'm like the dark night, you know, I go in, I go in, and, you know, that's it, and it's interesting, you know, I, uh, it, but it has to be like that for me, you know, that's just the type of painter I am, and I was pretty staunch about that when I was younger, I was, I was very righteous about that when, in my youth, and I would argue with other painters about the importance of that. And now, you know, I realize, and we've discussed this, that there's enough sunshine for everybody. You know, there's a lot of different types of painters out there. Everybody's doing their own thing, and it's great. You know, variety is the spice of life. But I'm gonna be doing my thing. <laughs> this, is, this is what it is. Yeah. So, we can go through some more. How are we doing on time? Yeah, okay, five. Yeah, I mean, is there anything you want to ask? I mean, no, I just enjoy I, I, the conversation. I think, yeah, no, and I can look at these paintings all day, but it's better if you really want to look at them. I think to go into the gallery and really, really yeah. in the museum and yeah. and see them in person, it's much more rewarding. I think from this, I, I, you know, I think the thing, you know, this the metaphor, the the, the painting we just talked about with the tulips, with I'm forgetting the title of the. Wandering Widow. Wandering Widow. Yeah, we can go back to it. Yeah. Well, and then here's Harvest, too, so. Well, this is very... It's similar in composition because of, you know, the stocks and everything. But uh, this, this is interesting because this painting, of all 31 paintings, took me the longest to complete. Wow. It took me five years to finish this painting from start to finish. And it actually was be even begun... It began in a studio and finished in another studio. Mm. And... Uh, and uh, I have to recognize a gentleman uh, who, whose memory this painting is dedicated to in this exhibition, who is a dear friend of mine named Franz Winans. Um, and uh, his associate, Susie Sabla, is here with us tonight. I'd like to recognize Susie. And together, they um, lent this painting from the Art Novel collection uh, based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, I'm thrilled to have it here. You know, it really, it's an autumnal painting. It uh, could almost read as a monochromatic painting because of the, you know, the hot palette oranges and things that are happening in it, but uh, there's so much activity. It almost feels like it could fall apart at the top portion. You see that? But if you see it in the flesh, in the gallery, it doesn't, you know? And uh, I'm going to let you decide why it doesn't. I don't want to sit here and tell you what it has to mean, okay? I want you to walk away with what you think it means. Because what I want for audiences to take away from nature's course is a sense of wonderment. Because that's why I do what I do, you know? It's, it's a sense of wonderment that I get from the exploration of the process of painting itself that I'm in love with. And uh, now you're getting to experience the completed paintings 
And it's a different type of wonderment that you get to experience as an audience. And I uh, hope you'll get to spend some time with the paintings, come back multiple times. This is an incredible institution. Uh, there was nothing like this in Oklahoma when I was growing up. I feel really happy for today's youth yeah. that here that they get to experience something like this and to be a part of it is a dream come true. So, Matt, thanks, buddy. I well, really, hey, uh, man, I, I really I don't appreciate have to, you. You know, he makes it easy, right? He makes it easy. I thought I, I mean, was going to have to. Was that five minutes? You wind him up go. and he goes. You know, and it was beautiful. And thank you for sharing your experiences with these works. I think it's really a gift, and, uh, and I certainly want to thank you for asking me to be part of it, Jeremiah and everybody here at the museum. And it's great to be back in Oklahoma. I got to get out there and see some old friends in Tulsa, not here. I'd never been to Oklahoma City before, so this is really exciting. When was the last time you were here? 80, 1983. Were you shooting? Are you having? Yeah, that's okay. when we finished wow. working in Tulsa, yeah. That's uh, amazing. With, uh, these, I, I guess I did, well, I never called it a trilogy, but there were three yeah. S.E. Hinton books. And it, I got to go to the Outsider's house, which was really great. Brought back a lot of memories. Danny's here. And it really brought back a lot of memories. That was sort of like, wow, it clicked. It was like, I, and, and I think when we filmed a lot of the movie was right around this time of year. That's fantastic. Oh, it's good to be back here. Yeah. But John, I mean, I came here for you, and thanks. And this thanks is for an being incredible here. show. And thank you, thanks. and thank, thank you, you all for coming here. Everybody, go check out the exhibition downstairs if you haven't seen it already. It'll be on view through August fifteenth. Thanks again to Matt Dillon and John Newsom. <laughs> Do you want to say hi or do you want to keep going?